Yeah, so then, um, my, so I have some links, some, research, some connections to the philosophical works referenced in this that um, we're going to make available after the talk. And so my approach is going to be to be very content heavy, drop a lot of information on you, and, and uh, give you some time to digest it. And then you can look into what you're most interested in um, in, in detail later. Um, so uh, the topic is inductive inference. And my plan is to get to Salmonoff induction, which I think is a relatively modern, it's 1960s, finding an inductive inference. <coughs> and in order to explain what Salmonoff induction is, uh, and why it's so important, I have to give you a history of most of the other things we know about inductive inference. So I think it's a, it's a good way to organize the talk. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jeff Eldred. I'm a physics PhD student in the APC department. Um, so, um, right, so the first thing is Occam's razor, because Salmonoff induction is basically an attempt to formalize or prove Occam's razor. Um, and then I'm going to talk about induction in general. And in particular, the key concepts are Bayes' theorem and the principle of insufficient reason. Um, then in order to, to explain Solomonoff induction, I have to cover something called Kolmogorov complexity and also what a Turing machine is and why it's significant. And then we get right into Solomonoff induction. By that point, the proof should be relatively short. And then we can get into caveats, implications, case studies. And I think that will flow right neatly into the discussion-oriented period of the talk. So actually, Occam's razor is really not unique to Occam. Um, Occam's writing in the 1300s and other people at the same time have similar ideas. Um, but you can find it in as early as Aristotle and Ptolemy. And um, so Aristotle says, we may assume the superiority all things being equal, the demonstration which derives from fewer postulates or hypotheses. What he's saying, the superiority, he says, the demonstration means explanation. And superiority means it's better to use this explanation, which derives from fewer postulates or hypotheses. So the, the case that's most trivial is if you have the complete ability to explain a phenomenon with a set of assumptions. Um, there's no point in adding additional assumptions that don't help you explain it any better. So that's the idea of Occam's razor, is cut out these extra ideas that you don't need to convey the concept. Um, but, um, but see, if in Ptolemy's formulation, you see a slightly different connotation. We consider it a good principle to explain phenomenon by the simplest hypothesis possible. So there, it's not just about cutting out excess uh, assumptions. It's about whatever hypothesis is simplest. And if you could find some way to define what's simplest, that should be most likely. And um, there's also this idea of what, what is good practice for communication? What do you use to explain to something, something to someone? And there's also kind of what is actually an inference about reality. What is actually likely to be true is, is what's simpler. And so the modern formulation is the theory which explains all and assumes the least is most likely. Um, or if, if you're using it to not explain everything, whatever explains the most for how much it assumes is the best theory. Um, and the word that I'm introducing here is uh, parsimonious. And uh, for, for those who aren't familiar, it means a lot the same of this mathematical elegance that uh, Lexi was telling us about, except for it doesn't have the connotations of aesthetics. It just means the property of fitting well with Occam's razor, the property of explaining more and assuming less. And so I'll, I'll use that. Um, for those who aren't familiar. So this is associated with Occam because of the way he used it, um, mostly, is in Occam's world, there's God, and God created matter and all the things that we see around us. But he didn't like the idea of there being universals and the same footing of God. For Occam, universals are just abstractions upon matter. And he didn't think it was necessary to posit the existence of things that uh, did not relate to actual map to God's creation. He thought it violated his sense of God's economy um, to have these extra universals that don't necessarily relate. And um, you know, so uh, you can see that he's still thinking in a Pythagorean kind of way of elegance coming from God, but he's he's also starting to break from it because he's saying that you can use this to cut out even things like universals. Um, 
And so I'm not going to follow Occam's interpretation. So he was Aristotelian, right? Not Platonic, actually, but Aristotelian. Oh, as perhaps, yes, perhaps that would be. Universals, he, he did not assume that universals by themselves do exist. They did not, according to him. They, they yes. exist only in connection with the real material things. Yeah, so I would say that this is, you know, uh, I'm not going to necessarily follow Occam's train of thought, but it, I know there's, there's variations in how Occam's <laughs> razor is supposed to relate to this view of God. Um, and, of, and of course, uh, Newton also subscribed to Occam's razor, and he used it to argue for gravity. I, his argument, essentially, was, uh, so we have objects falling, we have the motion of heavenly bodies, and we have the tides. And we can come up with three different explanations for these. Might be better to just come up with one thing. Universal gravitation explains all of these. And um, some of the, his contemporaries had objections. They said, well, you know, how does this force work? Why is it that way? You know, how can you have an action at a distance? Why don't we see anything else like it? And he didn't even attempt to answer these questions because for him, he thought we're just being, a, we're being just as arbitrary when we try to answer these questions about tides and objects falling and that sort of thing. And it would be better, we're, we're making progress if we can tie all these different disparate physical events to just one universal law of gravitation, if we, even if we don't understand why it works. Um, I think there's the one thing missing from the modern definition, which yeah. is that the theory does not be contradicted by any known facts. Right, that's, I, I, I hope to put that in explains all, but it's important. Yes, it has to be self-consistent and it can't be, it can't fail to explain it is, you know, maybe the way to, it, it, can't, it can't be contradicted, right? Um, so a lot of these thinkers justify Occam's razor as a preference in the mind of God, but however you justify it, Occam's razor is clearly a cornerstone of the scientific method. You used it for gravity, Euler for least action, Einstein for relativity, Planck for photons. It's, it's ubiquitous in positing new ideas in science and trying to justify them in many direct as well as subtle ways. Um, so the question, so um, I turn to Hume now because Hume attempts to apply Occam's razor to eliminate God. And uh, I, um, for those who are interested in uh, the God debate, I highly recommend Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion by Hume, seven, uh, 1779. And uh, this is a complete break from any kind of notion of Occam's razor coming from God because Hume is pitting Occam's razor against God. And so, just by doing that, whether or not you buy uh, Hume's argument, it starts to ask the question, on what basis is Occam's razor justified? <laughs> Where are you allowed to use it? Is it just a tool that science uses, and is it inappropriate to use beyond it, or is it something that speaks to something deeper than that? And, um, and so obviously, this shows, um, this idea was very controversial at the time, uh, which is why Hume had the dialogues published uh, posthumously, or post-humorously. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, and then you can see this, you know, uh, science has started to invade other fields and say, you should standardize the way you do your uh, field like scientists have done. And in the 1970s, you get this kind of counter-reaction, a b backlash against this. Um, and uh, the, the phrase epistemological pluralism is coined. And, um, the idea is that fields can be so diverse from each other that what is true for one field might not be true for another. So just because a method works for science doesn't mean you should go on and assume that it can be applied to history, sociology, uh, philosophy, economics. And, and, just and a result, say, from literary criticism or philosophy might not be able to be translated into terms that the other fields like science and history could understand. So there's this idea of a fundamental incompatibility, you know, what if that's the case, in which case um, science should stay in its box, it should, it should, there's a space that it should not go beyond, and that would include Occam's razor. Um, I also think of Stephen Jay Gould's famous um, idea of no, non-overlapping magisteria, and he explains it this way, the magisterium of science covers the empirical realm, what the universe is made of, and why does it work that way. The magisterium of religion extends over questions of ultimate meaning and moral value. These two magisteria do not overlap, nor do they encompass all inquiry. Um, so he's setting this clear line in the sand between science and religion, says there cannot possibly be any conflict because they do different things.
Well, you know, the obvious objection is that many people define their religion not just to mean moral philosophy. That it's important to them that um, uh, that their god or their their view of cosmology has certain implications for how the world works and why does it work that way. Science um, without religion is lame. Huh? I don't understand. <laughs> clearly against this. Right. Right. Um, so yeah, there's clearly lo lots of people who who want to mix their science and their religion and are uncomfortable with this. But I do think this speaks to a tendency of the time to to demark the territory of science and say good science doesn't go beyond um, uh, what you, you know uh, what it absolutely has to. Um, but I think this is a false dichotomy because you can't. Well, we'll, we'll get into it. So this raises the question of the scope of Occam's razor. Um, and this leads me into induction, because I want to take a step back and talk about principles of induction, and because they're intimately related with Occam's razor. So my operative de definition of induction is inference about the unknown by extrapolating a pattern from the known. I think that's a fair definition. Um, and one of the first things you come into is the problem of induction. So if someone's going to doubt that induction is valid, how would we justify inductive inference? And this is most strongly associated with Hume again in his inquiry concerning human understanding, because Hume worries a lot about this. And basically, he says, well, the, the natural thing to do is to justify induction and say, it works. We all use induction, and we see that it works. But the problem is, you have to use induction to justify why it will continue to work. Because what you're saying is, it worked yesterday, therefore, I'm justified in using it tomorrow and you're extrapolating a pattern, and you're using circular reasoning if you can't use induction to prove induction. Um, so for Hume, this is as good as it gets. We all rely on induction, but we can never justify it. Um, and uh, so Hume's example for how we all rely on induction is, so when you woke up this morning, uh, did you leave by the door, or did you leave by the window? If you left by the door, it means you had some expectations that that would be the easier way to go. And uh, so merely navigating our environment, we rely on all our past experience, all of our subtle subconscious learning about what we expect, a certain level of continuity, a certain level of logic, a certain level of uh, uniformity. And the other example I like is if I play a sequence of tones in your ear, you cannot help but notice when there's a pattern. And in some ways, this is how music works. It, it uh, satisfies your brain's expectation of a pattern, and then it subverts it by making you think you're going to get a pattern and breaking the pattern in strategic ways. And what patterns you immediately recognize and what patterns you expect have a lot to do with your history of listening to music, which is why the music that you've listened to changes the way you hear music. And you cannot help but do this if you have a brain that is capable of recognizing patterns from an auditory source. Um, so uh, it's very deep in the way we operate, and no one rejects induction um, in order to argue for any idea. Um, and the last point I want to make about induction is that it's related to this idea of uniformity of nature. If the universe changed so rapidly that everything we learned about how the universe worked yesterday is useless for how it works uh, tomorrow, then induction would not be a useful tool for us. And the fact that induction worked is telling us something about nature itself. And I think that uh, that's where it gets a little uh, deeper. Um, uniformity and probably a relative simplicity, that we believe that we are able to decipher it. Yes, yes. So yeah, I guess technic you know, you can you can uh, you can ask whether uniformity and simplicity are the same thing, you know. Uh, and um, they are they're, they're different. They're subtleties. Um, um, so uh, Talking about all this likelihood and probability and patterns, and uh, it's useful to have numbers. <laughs> and so in 1763, Bayes writes the writings that will become Bayes' theorem, but really it's Laplace that recognizes uh, Bayes' works and popularizes it and really uh, tries to apply it to the universe. Um, so Bayes' theorem is actually a really straightforward result from conditional probability. If you define what A given B means, or or how to calculate something like A and B, you just get that equation. Um, and you define the symmetric form, then you have probability A, B given A. And you just divide both sides by probability of B, and that's what Bayes' theorem is. So it, it, it's, you know, as a 
as a deduction. It's not too advanced, but it shows a, a really uh, direct way uh, how conditional probabilities are related to each other, and that's why it's so important. Um, so one thing you can do is you can say probability A is one event and probability B is another event and they have some relation. And you can use this to prove that you should eliminate unnecessary conditions. So let me give you an example. I can assign a probability, what is the probability someone will rob my house tomorrow? Okay. What is the probability a man wearing a blue hat will rob my house tomorrow? Well, the first scenario includes the possibility of the second scenario. So the probability of the first scenario has to be greater than the second scenario. You don't even know what those probabilities are, but the simpler and more generally stated hypothesis has to be more likely. And so this is kind of a trivial subset of Occam's razor, and you can, you can write it out with Bayes' theorem just, just like that. Um, but the unit is less complete. Hmm? Yeah. Simpler is less complete. Yes. Something yeah. will happen, definitely. Yeah? Right, right. <laughs> Something will happen. Yeah. This law of nature <laughs> yeah. proved to be correct. <laughs> so the, uh, the, 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 the other way to do it is A is some hypothesis that you're testing, and B is evidence that is, is some kind of test. So what is the plausibility of the hypothesis before you look at the evidence, and then after you look at the evidence? or given the evidence, what is the probability um, that you would infer? And so you use this to, to weigh evidence and to test claims when you have probabilistic information. So I'll give you an example. Um, so sci two psychologists uh, popularized this kind of word problem just by saying, can people solve this? And you know, do they need Bayes' theorem to do it? Um, and can you change the phrasings and they'll do better? Um, so the word problem is this. Suppose 1% of women being screened for breast cancer actually had breast cancer. Now, um, if, uh, if a woman actually has breast cancer and she takes this test, then the test will have a positive result 80% of the time. If she actually does not have breast cancer, then 9.6% of the time there will be a positive result. But of course, this is a false positive because I just told you she does not have breast cancer. So now you invert it. You say, given a woman if a woman going in for screening gets a positive result on the test, what does that tell you about the probability that she has breast cancer? And um, you know, I I, uh, I won't give you time to <laughs> to work it all out, but um, I'll just say that it's tempting to say something like seventy to eighty percent because you have that eighty percent chance of a positive result, and you know, okay, eighty percent minus nine point six, no, but that's not the answer. Um, the answer is 7.8%. And the reason why is because 99% of the women don't actually have breast cancer. And so if 10% of them get a false positive, you're talking about 10 false positives. But the one that has it, you're talking about a 0.8 true positive. So 0.8 divided by 10 gives you about 8%. And then that's, that's how you get the answer. Um, but this is, can be hard for humans to intuitively grasp because well, it's been discovered 50 to 85% of physicians get this question wrong. And uh, they do a little bit better if you turn it into frequencies instead of probabilities or if they have personal knowledge of the breast cancer screening pop false positive rates. But um, what this speaks to is a human tendency to ignore base rates. That's the 1% of women being screened for breast cancer, and then after the test, it goes up to 8%. Um, and so, these are called base rates or sometimes prior probabilities because you assign a probability before the evidence and then you assign a probability after the evidence and that's called the posterior probability. So when you have circumstantial evidence like this, when you have an imperfect test, the prior probabilities become very important. Um, and so this would be the case when you're doing something at the edge of knowledge, um, something that we have no data about and you're coming up with the first test or when you're doing something in a fuzzy field like, say, psychology or economics or history, uh, you, you, might not ha you may only have circumstantial evidence. And so what your prior probabilities or the inherent plausibility of the ideas that you're, you're testing is going to be very uh, influential. And uh, they don't always have the luxury that physicists often do of doing the most precise tests that can account for all the variables and get a very clean cut test that will tell you what the answer is regardless of what assumptions you make going in. Um, 
And so I, I just want to give you another example. So, you know, it, suppose you're a historian and you have a body of documents and some of them are missing. And you're trying to figure out, were those documents intentionally destroyed or were they just lost to natural causes? They had some flood or some disaster or just lost. Um, so if you're a good historian, you'll look at the documents that you do have and look for evidence that will try to um, weigh one way or another for each of those two stories that you can come up for how the documents were lost. But if you're a Bayesian historian, you can do better. You can say, but how often does it turn out that missing documents were lost due to intentional destruction? And how often does it turn out that they were lost to time? How often, when the evidence is this good, does it turn out to be each of those two hypotheses? And maybe you have those information and maybe you don't, but if you at least make an attempt to estimate those probabilities, you can get a much more accurate result. And uh, so there's a lot of people advocating uh, an increased use of Bayesian style testing and Bayesian style thinking, especially in the soft scientists, but the sciences. What is the nomenclature you Right, um, so in the previous page, I had probability of B given on the bottom. And so what this, so, oh, this symbol means yeah, not. So okay. if there's two cases, A or not A, then, then that's true. Okay. And so probability of B has been replaced with this complicated denominator. And that actually, I should have put the numbers in here, but that actually fits the word problem because mm -hmm. point, uh, point 0.1 goes here and point 0.99 goes here. But if you, if, you ignore, if you ignore the second expression, then you don't get the right answer. Mm -hmm. um, this example which you, which you gave us about uh, this 1% of this, this sort of mistake, it, it is called base rate fallacy. Right, base rate fallacy, yes. It's often called base rate fallacy. And that's just to say, Whenever someone ignores base rates or fails to uh, fails to think of how important they might be, um, the last thing I'll say about Bayes' theorem is there's this problem of priors. I gave you the prior probability and the word problem, but that prior probability you could say is based on some evidence. You have some confidence that it's the case. You you took you measured it somehow, and so you can start to ask the question: Well, how do I trust my prior probabilities? Well, the way you do it is you do another Bayesian analysis. You can come up for evidence for why you should believe the probabilities are what they are. But, you can, but this process can never end. Someone can always ask for you to do another Bayesian analysis, and you have to constantly look at how you know what you know, what you know, what you know. Eventually, you just have to start with some assumption about what your prior probabilities are. And you know, maybe it's OK to get an approximate answer if you, you have a good estimate of what the prior probabilities are at one of these steps. But if this is your worldview, that this is how all, all induction should be made, or you know, all inferences should be made, you have a problem of priors. Where do you get your original prior probabilities, and how would you ever justify this? <coughs> and um, so Laplace comes up with uh, a pretty good partial solution to this problem. So actually, Laplace wasn't the first person to write about um, what he would call the principle of insufficient reason. It's a play off of Leibniz's principle of sufficient reason, and also called the principle of indifference. So Laplace wasn't the first to write about it, but he was the one who really applied it to Bayes' theorem and emphasized um, how it would be used. And it's just this. The probability of events that you know nothing about are equal. So suppose either A or B will occur, but not both. What is the probability A will occur? The only right answer to this question is 50%. If I tell you more about A or B, you don't have to pretend to be neutral. But because the labeling A and B are not significant, the only correct answer to the probability you assign here is 50%. And uh, Laplace's formulation was, well, why not? You can't tell me a reason to prefer one over the other. I think the, the modern, the better way to say it is any inference you make about the probability of events must respect any symmetry in your knowledge about the events. So, you know, if you get really formal, you could have A1 through AN, and you can say, I can permute A1 and A7, and then relabel, and then this must not change the probability, therefore the probabilities must be equal, and you can, you can talk about symmetry groups as they apply to this. But um, uh, it, it's, it's interesting to, to think about um, things that you don't, um, you, it's assigning probabilities to things you don't know about. And um, actually, I don't know if I'll have time to get into it, but you can, James has written about uh, a relation to principle of indifference 
to uh, statistical physics. When you have two indistinguishable quantum states, the probability that you will occupy either one of them has to be equal. And uh, so what we do in statistical analysis is actually has a direct analog to what we do when we're making inferences about um, identical or similar states. Um, uh, so, uh, but uh, this doesn't, you should notice that this doesn't actually solve all, all the, completely the problem of priors. Because what if there is no simple symmetry, but you still don't know how to estimate the prior probability? So this would be, if I gave you a great deal of information about A and B, but you don't, you, and that make A and B diff, very different from each other, but you still don't have any evidence one way or another. And um, this is the, the hole that Salmanoff and Bashan should patch up. Um, so for me, the key concept that I have to begin with is kind of the digitalization of abstract ideas. So Wittgenstein's writing Philosophical Investigations in 1953, and what the majority of this book is, is a series of examples, language games that he, call, uh, he calls them, and in which words have meaning only in the context of the game. So suppose you are in a foreign country and you see two workers working on a project and one of them says a word you don't recognize, but the other worker hands him a wrench. Now what can you infer about the meaning of that word? Maybe the word means wrench, maybe it means hand me the wrench, maybe it means here's the problem that I need, figure out what tool that I need. But in the context of the working, all those phrases are equivalent. You know, they, they, they actually have, it actually has a meaning. But to you, all they, it could be any of them. And um, so he, he comes up with a lot of examples, and he, he focuses also on how we acquire language in the first place. How do I learn what the word for table is? Well, someone points to a table and says, that's a table. That's a, that's a light. That's a ceiling. You know, you, by demonstration is how we learn the meaning of words. Now, at this point, uh, this may seem like a horrendous reductionism, or it may seem like really basic, really obvious foundation of linguistics. And I encourage you to see it as the latter, because he's not saying abstract ideas uh, have no truth value or they cannot exist. What he's saying is, in terms of what people can ever say they, they, uh, they understand when they say they understand what this word means, it has to be demonstrable, even in principle. You have to be able to communicate words for words to have meaning. Um, and so there's a kind of natural limit um, to, to the meanings of words that can be traced to a kind of experiential, practical foundation. And that's, that's what he's saying. Um, so at the same time, I'm going to relate this in an unusual way. Around the same time, we discovered methods to completely digitalize communications. So in 1957, NIST produces the first digital image, and that's what it is. It's an adorable baby. Um, so. This image is numerically encoded and then transmitted and then produced. And, the, uh, and any kind of human communication has been digitalized in this way, video, audio, text, whatever. Um, and, uh, and, and the encoding is not, not unique. You can have a more compressed form. You can have a more expansive form. It's dependent on the language that is the computer language that's going to interpret it. But it's highly functional. I can t take an image with higher resolution than my eye is able to detect and transmit it via computer. You can talk about ways to um, represent that information. So this is going to justify the idea that our human communication can be safely encoded as a sequence of ones and zeros without loss, um, and uh, or without important loss, perhaps. Um, so that's that's where the story begins for me. Um, the next concept is Kolmogorov complexity. Uh, now, Kolmogorov complexity is associated with the great Soviet mathematician Kolmogorov and Samanov induction with an American uh, philosopher, uh, mathematician uh, Solomonov. But, um, but actually, both were very intimately related in both findings. Solomonov and Kolmogorov were in kind of correspondence when they, they came up with these findings together. So it's kind of the way we his, tell the story historically to give Kolmogorov the complexity and Solomonoff the induction. Um, but it, it can be disputed. Yeah, so they communicated. Yes, yes. Um, and uh, you, can, you, know, you can read about the history if you're, if you're interested. But I think, I think, I want to say it was Solomonoff who published a paper, and then that prompted Kolmogorov to publish 
another paper, and then Solomonoff was in works of another, you know, like it was very much, uh, very close um, findings. Um, so the idea of Kolmogorov complexity is given a string y, uh, k of y is the shortest possible description of that string y. So what is the shortest possible description? Well, it's hard to say, but it's really easy to come up with upper bounds. If you can come up with a way to compress a string, then you know that Kolmogorov complexity is no greater than that compression. Um, so this example is just straight from Wikipedia, but I, I really like it as an example. So, so consider the 32 character sequence just A, B, A, B, A, B, right? Well, an easier way to say that in an English language compression would just be A, B, 16 times. And that sequence, A, B, 16 times, is a character sequence that's shorter than A, B, A, B, A, B. And this is telling you that if you wanted to transmit this information uh, through a computer, you wouldn't need the whole character sequence. You could just use the compression by telling you what an AB is and then telling you how to repeat it and then telling you how many times to repeat it. Um, but uh, the way this is going to tie into Solomonoff induction is it's saying the fact that you can represent AB in such a simple manner means that it's telling you something about the true nature of, a, of this string. In other words, if you had you were you were computer programming and this error came up A B A B A B A B at 32 character sequence and you're trying to anticipate what the 33rd and 34ths are, well, you would be justified in saying your best bet is that it's A and then B again, and and until the pattern unless the pattern changes, there's no reason why you should suppose that this will stop, and that's a natural. Uh, extrapolation of this pattern, and that pattern comes from the most, the shortest possible description of that sequence. Whereas if you look at the second one, you know, you can say, it looks randomly generated to me, uh, here's the alphabet that it comes from, but you, you can't really say anything further, and even a description on how to generate this with a pseudo-random number, number generator, you couldn't beat the length of that string, and so it probably can't be simplified earlier. There's probably no interesting information there. Now, it could be that there's some elegant mathematical formulation that'll give you just that, um, but but probably not. Um, and that's that's basically all you can say about it. Um, so, Kolmogorov complexity is defined for a given language. The first example is just an English language. You can use programming languages. You can do all sorts of mathematical notations. They're all languages. Um, and so you can ask, well, how does the Kolmogorov complexity for one language compare to the Kolmogorov uh, complexity of another language? Well, it can be easily shown that at, at the very least, if you can translate every language into every other language, then there is a certain finite length it takes to, to, to do a translation, to explain how the notation in one language corresponds to the notation in the other language. So at the very least, you can say, as your Kolmogorov complexity. Here's how to speak this other language, and then here's what it's represented in this other language. So the Kolmogorov complexity can differ no more than a constant, and that constant would be a translation constant. So is, is the Kol is that KY, is that an integer, or how is it actually defined? Uh, I, I, I believe it's, a, it, it's an integer is the idea. Number of characters. What is the, the number, what is the minimal men message length? Is a, it, so, so, I mean, it depends on how many letters you have in the alphabet and so on. But the first one, A, B, A, B, A, B, uh, that can be compressed to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 10 characters uh, because I have so many letters in the alphabet and so many digits or 10 digits to use and so on. I think, uh, okay. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. But if I had an alphabet, okay. So it's very dependent on the language, and that's the, yeah. that's the tricky part about it. Um, but it, it, does, it does say something. Mm -hmm. if, if you can just focus on one language um, and then start to say how languages relate, I think is the way to think about it. Um, the last concept I need to cover is a Turing machine. So 1936, Alan Turing is writing before computers really become what we know them to be. Um, but he gives this, this thought experiment of a simple serial computer. So there are... So a tape is an infinite series of these one-bit cells, and the, the cells can carry either a one or a zero. And the Turing machine has allowed one tape for input, one for output, and one for working, analysis, memory, that sort of thing. And the Turing machine follows instructions, and instructions can just tell it to read or write one bit at a time or to move the tape. 
Um, and so it can, depending on what it reads, it can, it can follow different instructions depending on the result. And so this is a really simple machine, but what's uh, surprising about it is it turns out to be in comp completely equivalent to the capabilities of a modern computer. Anything a modern computer can do, including the things that modern computers can, in principle, simulate, can, in principle, be calculated on a Turing machine. So they kind of, it, what this is telling us is that the hardware is, in some sense, not important. It's, it's the, there is a, a more universal sense of what software could possibly do. Okay, so you mentioned that's Church's thesis, but that's exactly right. That's a thesis, right? That's a statement. Right, right. What you mean for something to be from, that's in some sense, in some sense, that's a definition, one of the possible definitions of what you mean for something to be computable, but it's not a proof. That's, that's exactly right, yeah. So at the time this was proposed, the way they were saying it is a Turing machine is capable of simulating any computable algorithm. But the better way, right, is a computer algorithm, what that means, a, a computable algorithm means anything that is possibly simulated by a Turing machine. And so um, one of the big questions, if you're going to object to Solomonoff induction, is well, what are we missing by relying on Turing machines? And is it, is it patchable? Um, and uh, is it uh, the fact that we, c you know, if we can simulate something that gets arbitrarily close to, but not precisely to a phenomenon, is that a good enough replacement, or is that, you know, is, are, are we losing something? And so there's a lot of questions, and some people try to say uh, a physical Turing, Turing church thesis, which is the thesis that the physical universe can be accurately represented by a Turing machine or a simulation on a Turing machine. Um, so, you know, you can get into it, um, and I think that's part of this. Um, the last concept is a universal Turing machine. So, you can tell a Turing machine, to, you can design a Turing machine so it can do anything that any other Turing machine can. So, the way you do this is your data begins with a header that tells you how to interpret the remainder of the data. And if you had to, your header could just be a description of what the Turing machine's rules are and what they do. But uh, the easiest way is like a jukebox where you have some predefined programs and it tells you which to run. And then so after the header, you have your normal data. So, you know, run the algorithm that is uh, a square root and then here's the bit string for 42 and then it will tell you an infinite sequence representing the bits for the square root of 42. Um, and uh, so the way you define universal Turing machine, there are many, there's infinite universal Turing machines that would, that would do different things in response to different headers, but each of them could do what any other of them could do. Um, so now we're ready for Solomonoff induction. So all of your observations, images, speech, memories, whatever, you encode them as some data Y. And remember this encoding isn't unique, but let's <laughs> say you, you have an encoding of it. Um, this data is, you hypothesize this data is the output of some algorithm that could be run on a universal Turing machine U. Um, and that it, the, you have an input S with length L that goes into the universal Turing machine U and spits out data Y. So now you say, well, because of principle of indifference, let's just say that input S is random. And if we have an infinite uh, sequence of bits as input, the, the shorter the sequence that, the, the shorter the sequence that you need, if you only need the first 10 bits, then that is a more likely random input into your Turing machine than something that only needs, um, that, that, that needs, say, 20 bits. So with each extra bit that is significant in your input, you decrease the likelihood. And so, uh, if you, the expression is, okay, for a string S that um, outputs Y in universal Turing machine U, then the probability of S given or with U is 2 to the minus length of S, and then a normalization just w which represents all other, all, all other uh, strings. But you could say maybe proportional to 2 to the minus F length of S. And um, so I've written it in a binary fashion um, because I'm saying the length is in bits. But you can, you can do a generalization for a non-binary system. And uh, perhaps the more useful form would not be to say S is true because maybe you can't understand what S is because it's just a sequence of bits. 
but you could say, what is the probability that a certain sequence z will follow the existing data y? And then you're really making an inference about, uh, from the available data about what data to expect <coughs> in the future or what completes the available data. Um, and so if you're having tr trouble with this, I would just go back to this, this example Kolmogorov sequence of AB, AB, AB. Well, if you think AB follows that, um, that's a relatively simple idea because it can be represented simply. And uh, it's, it's therefore a, uh, a, a good hypothesis for what will occur. And you could show that um, for a, a fair uh, trying of all uh, hypothesis, that, that is, it's more likely to come up. Um, and uh, so this is a little hard because you're kind of uh, defining the, the, the probability precisely, but implicitly. Um, so are you thinking of all the possible inputs S that give the output Y in this machine? Right. And, and so, you want to assign relative probabilities to them? Yes. So the, the idea with Occam's razor is all explanations that fit the data, that's the first cut. And then the second cut is what is the simplest of those explanations? Um, and if you get more data, you can pare down the list of hypothesis more. Um, so, um, the, uh, so the universal Turing machine, U, I mentioned is a free parameter of the model. Um, so the one thing, the one solace that we can take in this is any universal Turing machine can emulate any other universal Turing machine. So suppose your first universal Turing machine gets a 50% data compression rate, and your second gets only a 75% data compression rate. Well, at some point, your second Turing machine can use a constant length bit string to describe how to translate to the first Turing machine. So at some point, if you have enough data, it's going to be advantageous to switch to the better compression rate. So if you can do something like a high data limit, then the results of all Turing machines should converge, and they should converge for the same reasons. Um, so that, that might be comforting to say that you know, there are some circumstances in which the choice of U may not matter. Um, but it still seems a little surprising that, object, uh, that complexity cannot be defined in any kind of objective way. And uh, it seems to be, may, what, you know, maybe this doesn't undermine its applicability as Occam's razor, but it seems to be telling us something. Uh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, I don't understand what the machine you have to do with because the algorithm, let's go back one. Yes, yeah. Okay, so the algorithm is, in some sense, independent of the machine, right? And everything here just depends on what the algorithm is. Uh, let's see, where are we moving into this? Okay. Right, so... Um, You're saying that with different machines, the same algorithm will produce different results? So the, the, the algorithm has to be written in a certain language. Yeah. And so the, what la all the language is in that language U. So if you... If you, I mean, if you, you can take any computer and hand, it'll do different things when you hand it ones and zeros. So if you want to represent the same algorithm for different Turing machines, it's going to look different on different Turing machines. But if it's a simple algorithm, it should be a short input. Yeah, it'll look different on different machines, but the input-output structure should be, of the algorithm should not depend on the machine, right? I mean, you put in an input, you should get the same output, regardless of what the machine is, as long as you're running some algorithm, and maybe the algorithm gets coded differently on different machines. But in the end, the input up, the input S should produce the output Y. That dependence depends only on the algorithm, right? Not on the machine. Yeah. Well, I'm right? saying the algorithm is in the machine. The machine. Uh, okay. So when I say universal Turing machine, that includes not just the hardware. It's including what is the software preloading into it. It's including, you know. So I gave this analogy to a jukebox earlier. You know, one of them, if you tell it, run algorithm 14, it'll do one algorithm. Another one, you want algorithm 17. Okay, and so the algorithm's part of the machine. Yes, yeah. Um, so uh, Alexi was asking about this earlier, and uh, what I was trying to say is, in principle, a universal Turing machine should be able to simulate anything. So if you're trying to say simulate a universe, then you need initial conditions and what specific laws to use as your input. But your Turing machine could, in, in principle, it'll include all the algorithms. So any possible universe that could be simulated should be somewhere in the Turing machine. Um, so yeah. so you, you, you have to, um, 
I'm sure there must be a proof that you can't tell the Turing machine to assimilate the universe because the universe would include the Turing machine as part of itself. Right. Yes. Yeah, that's uh, that's another that's another thing is yeah. if yeah. if you are trying to simulate the entire universe, how do you include a self yes. model? Um, but this is a problem of compression and what is noise and what is law. Yeah. So what, what, you, what you agree to lose. But uh, artificial intelligence researchers are in particular interested in this because they actually want to build a computer program that runs Solomonoff induction and beats humans at pattern recognition. Or at least they want to know, in principle, what does it take. And in order to do that, I mean, humans have a partial self model, right? We uh, maybe we don't always think about whether our minds could be deceiving us or whether we're doing something in error, but we realize in order to have the most accurate results, we have to include the possibility that we might be wrong. And it seems like if a Turing machine, a, a, a machine, a computer program that's doing an artificial intelligence uh, representation of Solomonoff induction, they have to do the same thing. So how, how do you do that uh, is an open question right now. Could it mean that the Turing machine represents the fact that the input data is quantizable and finite? Yeah, um, yeah, so I, I am not sure what it would take. Um, I know one approach is to, to have the components of the, the Turing machine be part of the input. Um, but um, I, it, it, it seems like that puts you in a very strange territory about how you have to encode and how you have to analyze. So I'm not sure. Um, so the other problem is, you know, to get that normalization, you have to consider all possible inputs. Um, and uh, actually, you can prove that this is impossible to calculate explicitly. Because one of the first things that comes up is the halting problem, which is if you give an input to a Turing machine, you may not ever know whether that Turing machine will eventually output a result. And you don't want to say, you know, and so the question is, if you say, I'm going to wait a certain amount of time for it to output a result and then cut it off, what have you lost? And maybe you lost your, 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 your true answer for how the universe works. Uh, but if you have a relative comparison between two inputs which are known to halt, it, then you could do the calculation pretty straightforward. Um, and so this isn't entirely satisfying, I'm going to admit, you know. And it's, it's, Solomonoff induction seems hard to use explicitly. It seems like unless you're an artificial intelligence researcher, you don't use that equation to use Occam's razor. You use Occam's razor in the ways we're ordinarily familiar with. And, and Solomonoff induction just shows you that in principle, Occam's razor is correct, that, that, that it relates to something fundamental. Or more precisely, Solomonoff induction could show Occam's razor is a consequence of typical axioms in probability and information theory, if you want to get uh, really precise. So no, no god is required for Solomonoff induction. Um, and um, then what you do here is the prior probability, these probabilities you obtain from Occam's razor can then be used in Bayes' theorem to weigh evidence for competing theories, again, at least in principle. And then so now you have an inherent, a notion of inherent plausibility of theories, and then you have weighing the evidence probabilistically, and you're starting to get something that looks like a scientific model. And so what this is telling me is the scientific standard of evidence is applicable to all fields and all truth claims. That there's nothing in this story that required me to specify the application of the way we draw inductions. That the, the same standard of evidence that has worked so far, so well in science, in principle, does not have uh, limitations on the fields it's allowed to be applied to. Well, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. So, science uh, deals with things one can measure, right? So, whereas emotions, for example, are not measurable, we allow uh, fear and so on, not measurable and quantifiable. So, you can't really apply scientific standards to them. I would say that intangible and immeasurable are, are, are different. And then, in other words, a concept can be very abstract, it can be very complicated, it can require many moving parts, but that doesn't make it immeasurable. It may be hard to represent, but uh, this is part of my argument with Wittgenstein, is saying if you understand what love is, then it relates to demonstrable concepts. And it may be very complicated, it may be, it may be varying by different groups of people, what they understand, what it means, but in principle, it could be written down 
as a very precise, very long, complicated definition, and that definition could be encoded as a series of ones and zeros, and you'd expect certain properties to, uh, to hold for a kind of logical um, analysis of those ones and zeros. Um, so uh, certainly, it's not something that goes down with everyone's, but I think of, you know, I, I think of uh, abstract, con I mean, as, as physicists, we have seen abstract concepts arise from interactions that have good construct validity. I mean, an equilibrium point, does an equilibrium point exist? Well, it does in the interactions of, 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 of the system. Um, and even though you, you, on one sense, you can't reach out and touch an equilibrium point. It's not a thing. It's not a matter. On the other hand, it, it, it is so useful for understanding the system that it feels it's a useful tool for understanding, and uh, so I would I would argue that uh, that you can you can even, you can include uh, the human mind on it. But you know, uh, there's a good in theorem. Yes. That not all true statements can be proven. Yes. So then. The issue for, for this argument. Right, and so the uh, example is, uh, you know, if someone gives us one of these uh, girdle statements, uh, could we? Uh, uh, you know, we might assign some finite level of probability to it being true, um, if calling it true or false is even a coherent notion. Whereas Solomonoff induction would assign it zero probability because it can't it can't express it. Um, and so, you know, I think how uh, 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 Gödel's theorem affects this, and how uh, sometimes also called um, Tarski's uh, indefinability of truth. How that works is kind of complicated. Uh, it's open question, can you get arbitrarily close? Um, do we need undecidable, do we need to decide undecidable statements? It's a weird question, but it could be that all undecidable statements are in some sense irrelevant in terms of understanding, in terms of doing Solomonoff induction, in terms of uh, predicting what will happen next. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a complicated question, and I don't want to say that I have all the answers, but uh, uh, I think the useful thing about teaching Solomonoff induction is it tells you what are the right questions to be thinking about. You know, where, uh, when you're asking how do you justify Occam's razor, it gets to the very precise things that, uh, that, that would be the problem if you're going to, if you're going to refute Occam's razor or doubt it or limit its application. Um, so. Um, and then, so this is so this is my last slide, and uh, so this will lead right into the discussion. But um, I, I just thought of I put up some case studies, and feel free uh, to, to jump in. Um, so the first point I want to make is knowing what is likely is not the same thing as knowing absolute truth. We all understand this, but we also understand the consequences of knowing what's likely and how confident we should be in that can be quite immense. Um, so to put it in the dollar sense um, application of physics. Say, a neutrinoless double beta decay. What is the probability that that occurs at an appreciable rate? Well, if you assign that probability to be very high, well, it's not worth doing an experiment like EXO because we already know that it's the case. And if you assign it to be zero, it's pseudoscience. It's not, you know, we have good reasons to think that it won't occur. Then it doesn't seem like a top priority to explore. But if it has a finite level of probability, a reasonable cost to explore, and profound implications if you find one way or another, then it's, it's worth doing an experiment to investigate double uh, neutrinos, double beta decay. Um, so I think this can have um, thinking from, uh, uh, thinking about uh, fundamental uh, probabilities can be, can be useful. Um, so, you know, string theory. Is, is string theory true? Well, I'm not an expert in string theory, but from what I understand, it's that it's consistent with all the data but the problem is it's formulated more generally than we could ever hope for. It predicts things that we've never seen, and it allows for sets of parameters that do not in any way resemble our current universe. So what, do we, what is parsimony going to tell us about string theory? Well, no matter how intuitive it is, it's how mathematically elegant it is. And the real problem for string theory is, do they need extra assumptions to explain why the wide range of parameters um, allowable by string theory seem to fit these specific parameters that we have. If they seem to flow naturally from string theory, then it's a good theory. But if um, they seem to be very unnatural results, 
from a string theory-like framework, then it's a problem. Um, um, or how about Everett's many worlds interpretations versus Copenhagen interpretation? Um, as you know, it might be tempting, Occam probably would have done this, to say, well, we don't need all those extra universes. It's too much. Cut them out. But from a mathematical perspective, those universes are generated just as easily as one universe. The number of mathematical rules that you need to represent this concept is the same. Um, similarly, people who don't like indeterminism might be tempted to cut out Copenhagen interpretation. Oh, who's going to give you your random number table? Doesn't each random number have to be its own assumption? And again, I'd say is you let your Turing machine generate random numbers, or pseudo-random numbers even, um, then you don't have to say Copenhagen interpretation is unparsimonious. So it's up for debate, but to me, I don't think parsimony can tell you which of these two interpretations are the same. You can't do a physical experiment to distinguish them. Therefore, parsimony and you don't need to make any more assumptions about the mathematics. Um, therefore, parsimony cannot separate one for the other. Now, the, the philosophical differences between these two can be quite profound. Um, but I think you would need, uh, if, if you want to settle the question or you want to have an opinion based off of um, some evidence, you have, to you have to attack it from an entirely different way. Um, so I don't know if it, uh, if it does everything you want it to do. Um, Take dem democratic peace theory. So for those who aren't familiar, some people have, in, in international politics have put forward this idea. Well, democracies are less likely to go to war with each other than democracies and non-democracies are likely to go to war, or non-democracies are likely to go to war with each other. Um, so it turns out that this is really simple to state. I just stated it. And it fits the data relatively well. You can't say democracies have never gone to war with each other, but you can say that they're less likely to, statistically. So the question is, if you write or if you analyze an international pol politics scene, should you operate that, as though this were true? Should you think that this is likely simply because it's simple and it sit, seems to fit? Or should you say that, no, that's crazy, <laughs> that uh, you, that's uh, um, just because that's just, just, just some statistical fluke. Well, um, one way to say is, well, we don't know anything about international politics, so this is parsimonious, so this is good. The other way to say is we know quite a lot of it about international politics. We know it depends on things like geography and economics and history and uh, psychology, and you have to reconcile anything you posit in international politics with these other <coughs> fields. And so for me, the question for assessing some high-level phenomenological theory like democratic peace theory is, can you reconcile it with the rest of your world field? You have to come up with all these explanations for why it acts unexpectedly, then it's not a parsimonious theory anymore. It seems to naturally fit with available mechanisms that would describe how something like this arises, then you can accept it without feeling um, guilty that you're starting at a high level of analysis, a, a, a um, top-down perspective. Um, I think it also weighs heavily on the existence of supernatural. It, in some respects, what the supernatural means are things that you are not naturalistic, things that don't fit the normal mold of a kind of scientific uh, standardized uniformity. Um, so. To, to weigh a mythological story like uh, Jesus turning water into wine, well, which is more parsimonious? Um, that there's this additional law of the universe that water can sometimes become wine, or there is one more outlandish story that we cannot confirm its truth um, that seems to have come out of a certain time period. Well, the, the second one fits neatly into things, assumptions we already have about the universe, while the first one requires additional assumptions. So. I would say that, to me, this is a no-brainer. No but, of course, this is very controversial because, um, you know, people become very attached to certain stories and, you know, paranormal phenomena, psychics, that sort of thing. Um, and so, uh, but I would say, if you don't think we should teach in chemistry class that water can sometimes turn into wine, or in biology class that sometimes horses have wings, uh, you shouldn't believe these things for yourself. Because remember, there is only the scientific standard of evidence that can apply for all these things. So what you should use to assess whether or not this should be convincing to colleagues, whether this should be accepted as mainstream science, should also be the same standard you use to say, do I believe that this actually happened? And um, I don't want to dump completely on religion. I'd say modern religious uh, apologists uh, use Occam's razor as a cornerstone of their arguments for God. Uh, I think of William Lane Craig, who always tries to argue uh, 
Occam's razor weighs more heavily for his side than the atheist he's debating. Um, but it does show you the way you have to think about these things, I think, is updated because you cannot uh, easily use things that were conceived before in modern uh, widespread understanding of Occam's razor and its importance. Um, and uh, I would even, so last subject, another taboo, is moral truths. It's tempting to say moral truths are different. They don't depend on physical things. They're totally different. We can't apply Occam's razor to them. But let's just see what happens if you do. You know, uh, a kind of old religion idea is to have a list of do's and don'ts. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt keep the Sabbath holy. And, uh, and whether or not, and so if you have a moral lawgiver or whether you're working from some secular legalistic uh, idea of a moral philosophy. A list of do's and don'ts is always vulnerable to the question, well, why this list and why not some other list? And as long as you can ask that question, then it's open to attacks from parsimony because you can say a simpler list is more likely to be generated. So I would think of something like the golden rule. The golden rule says I have the same moral value as other human agents. And so when I do something like murder but wouldn't appreciate murder being committed against me, I'm violating the symmetry of the situation. And uh, you, something like the golden rule is very useful because it explains at least 95% of what we think of in terms of moral actions uh, without, uh, without positing much at all. It just posits that essentially that the moral values of people are equal and that they should be held to the same standards. Um, so I would argue that something like a golden rule based morality would have an inherently higher plausibility than something that is a basic list of do's and don'ts. And I think you can do something similar with uh, the old virtue ethics. You know, they would used to say, oh, you should be courageous, you should be compassionate, you should be, uh, you should be merciful. Uh, and, and this list of, you should be patient, you should come up with a list of virtues to embody. Um, but I think more parsimonious is to go to actions, go back to the golden rule, or to go to values and say something like, there's life, and there's happiness, and what you do matters, and has consequences. Um, and then this leads to a kind of utilitarian perspective where you can still ask, well, why life? Why happiness? How do you define these things? But it's simpler than coming up with these really uh, nebulous ideas of virtue ethics. And so I think even moral philosophy can learn from how do we state our ideas precisely, generally, why would we suppose they are the way that they are. Okay. <laughs> Many thanks. Great talk. <laughs> so, some more questions? <laughs> if, if, if you have some time. Or some, yeah, some. Yes, I do. I just want to come back to your supernatural on the last list. Oh, yes. Because, uh, definition of supernatural is not necessarily uh, clear cut. I mean, uh, we can say where it's natural if uh, we expect that physics can explain it, laws of chemistry, blah, blah, blah. But if I take something like uh, consciousness, my consciousness, um, mm -hmm. I some people might say, oh, well, one day we'll explain that in terms of laws of physics. Um, I think that's very unlikely, actually. Um, and I would say that is sort of, I can say that's supernatural because it's outside the realm mm -hmm. of science as we know it. It doesn't mean it's, it's God or anything, but it's something that is uh, sort of, you know. Right. I mean, so, well, yeah. would you, I mean, we, uh, would you feel comfortable giving it a set of rules that uh, have not yet been reconciled with how this go relates to modern science? But, you know, so I'm thinking of the, uh, some philosophers that have tried to say, you know, the rules of consciousness. You cannot hold too many things in your head at the same time. Consciousness, it, you know, like they try to, try to, this was kind of the origin of psychology where they tried to, in, introspectively determine the nature of consciousness. But uh, if you say it has not yet been reconciled with, say, the science of neurobiology, say, you know, you could still set a set of axioms for what are the rules of consciousness. You know, if I get hit in the head with a large object, I may lose something. I may become unconscious. I may, you know, I may die. You know, you can come up with, with rules that don't necessarily, we don't know. So that's, that's the way maybe to approach it is to say not that it's, it's unscientific to, to, to even talk about consciousness, but the way it is scientific is, 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 is distant. Maybe it's something <laughs> yeah. 
but freedom of will actually and creativity if to yes. understand freedom of will as our ability to create new things it yeah. goes against the idea that we may express our consciousness in a, uh, by means of any algorithm so the idea of our creativity and ability to do new things is actually sort of proof that our consciousness cannot be expressed in scientific way it is supernatural I, I, in that I, sense I, I would i would go to an experimental perspective what experimental result can not be explained uh, by a you know and, and that's that's how i would look at it because you know you can come up with this idea of okay if i was in a scenario exactly like this but got to make my decision again i could make it differently than the way i did you know maybe you can say something like that but until you can do that experiment it's not a scientific result that science can't explain because someone else could say, no, you would do the same thing if it's in the same scenario, you know? And so if you're going to, uh, I think the, the really sticking point for saying this cannot be explained with science has to be an experimentable, testable. I, I, I just gave yeah. you experimental. Uh, sci scientific data is something reproducible. You cannot take a scientific data which happened just once and then cannot be reproduced. And you or me are just observed and nobody can do it, nobody knows how to reproduce it. So scientific facts, it's not whatever may happen, but only reproducible things. Consciousness reveals itself in, um, um, is a, um, in creating new things which never happen. For instance, when Solomonov suggested his theory of Solomonov uh, induction, nobody before yet suggested it was really new thing and it was unique thing. It was happened just once, or Newton, Newton theory, or whatever. Any theory, any story, any poem, any music, invented just once. You cannot take it, and because of this, you cannot take it as a scientific fact, because it, it's well, well, unique. I, I, so a neuroscientist may, you know, may find, oh, we understand a, a feeling of love, if the feelings of love in this part of the brain is lighting up, and so on and so forth. They may, do, they may do that, I mean, but it still doesn't, for me, uh, touch with the feeling of consciousness that we all have. I, I presume you're there and you actually yeah. are. <laughs> let, 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 <laughs> let, me, let me answer Alexi's question first. I, I think it's certainly true that there's, there's mechanisms for explaining the creativity of the human brain. I mean, we know things can be deterministic. We know that things can be very complicated, complicated beyond our ability to readily predict. We know things that can be random. And all of, and uh, you know, if you were gonna say, I, I don't think you can say that just because we don't know explicitly how human creativity works, that it cannot in principle be reduced to some, complica some complicated formula of complexity, um, diverse inputs, uh, and uh, randomness. And so I think you have to use an appeal to ignorance to say, I do not know the answer, therefore the answer cannot be found. You know, can we know what is unknowable? You know, some question like, why are mountains so tall might have once seen, seemed unknowable, but of course we know about plate tectonics and we know that there's an, actually an answer to this. And uh, it's a very clear cut answer. So I think, uh, so I think if you wanna say we don't yet know, that's, that's a fair statement. If you want to say we can never know, I think that's, uh, that's very controversial. But also, <laughs> if you want to say we will know, then that's an act of faith. It's a faith in, in, in an advance of scientific knowledge and so on. To say that we will, because it's true we don't know, okay? <laughs> we don't know whether it will or will not be explicable in terms of natural phenomena. Okay. But there, there is even a paradox here. The paradox is that, let's assume that we are able in one day to get a theory which explains human creativity. And sure. we are checking and we are happy, explain this, explain this. And then I will ask you a question. Well, does this theory which explaining human creativity, does it explain its own appearance, appearance of that very theory? And this, if you will come, if you will tell yes, you will see that it is a paradox. This is a sort of Gödel theorem of incompleteness. So, and this is a proof that creativity can never be explained. So this saying, paradox. You are coming into paradox. So you're saying to explain a, okay, so if I have n worth of creativity and I explain that, 
then the explanation is more creative, and therefore I have to explain n plus one. Exactly, you have to explain your own explanation. This very level, explanation should level, be, ex its appearance level, level. should be explained in itself. And this is a paradox, it cannot happen.